Okay, so the, the, I, I've changed the title of the talk because what I was going to talk about, it's already published, so I will talk about two things that are not published yet. Um, I mean, one of them was already presented this morning by, I mean, the idea was presented by Eric very nicely of, of how to, can, you, can you exploit replication stress in cancer by using different compounds like ATR inhibitors. And this idea is very easy to explain. The idea is that when you have cancer cells that are suffering from replication stress, if you inhibit ATR, this might exacerbate the amount of replication stress and kill the cancer cells. So this is something we've worked throughout the years by doing mice that have low ATR, by doing cells where we can activate ATR, we can deactivate ATR, doing chemical compounds. And the status of this is that we, in 2013, we licensed out these compounds to Merck Serona. That means that it's now their thing. It's their, you know, I still consider my baby, but it's on their hands to bring this to the clinic. That doesn't mean we have completely abandoned working on these reagents. I mean, there are at least two lines of work where we actively keep working on these ideas in the lab. Uh, and so basically, what are we up to now? Basically, two things in a nutshell. So one thing we're doing is, I think, in addition to combinations, one way to go with these, with these genotoxic agents, which I think it's important, is to identify two more that are intrinsically sensitive to the compound. So you avoid combinations that could be cytotoxic for the patient. So we've been working on that, actually, also together with Andre, in identifying which tumors and which mutations will be particularly sensitive to an ATR inhibitor. And actually, I'm not going to be talking about that today, just for you know, for you to know. And then we also have been playing, of course, like many people around, to, to do genome-wide CRISPR screenings. Uh, to identify mutations that could make the cells resistant to the RNA and get strength to anticipate what could go, you know, how could tumors escape from, from these chemicals. But this is already published. So what I'm going to be talking about is, okay, ATR is fine. What about another proteins? What about another target? So is there any other protein that we can basically target and that will be particularly sensitive for cells that have replication stress? And here comes Paul D3. So Paul D3, you know, due to the work of people like Jim Haber and Thanos Halasonetis and Hickson and others. So what is Paul D3? It's a, it's a non-catalytic member of the Paul D complex. And it has been shown to be important for break induced replication, which is important for the repair of broken forks, for instance. It was also shown by Ian Hickson to be required for DNA repair synthesis in mitosis, which is supposedly also coming from replication stress. And it's interesting, it's not essential in Saccharomyces cerevisiae or chicken DT40 cells. So it raised the idea of whether you know, this is a non-essential member, important for break-induced replication, important for things you know, linked to replication stress. So potentially you could target it, and it, this would be more important for cancer cells than it is for normal cells. OK, so to address these questions, we also together with Thanos, we teamed up and tried to answer uh, these questions in, in mice. So we just made a knockout model, a conditional knockout model, where we can delete poly 3 see what happens. So what happens is that this is lethal. Uh, basically, you, you get no mosaicos. You get no ES cells. It's very, very lethal in, in mammalian cells. And if you have a good eye for numbers, you can actually see that it's not only lethal in the homozygous, but also you get fewer heterozygous that you expect from a knockout, hetero, knockout uh, lethal cross. So even a number of the heterozygous are not being born here. Okay? And from those, so this is what you will expect normally in 298, you get 185. And from those heterozygous animals that are born, they're also not happy, and a fraction of them die in the first month or so. Those that make it, they actually go through. And this is something we've seen with other models of replication stress. But the number of them die within the first month. And they die from something that has been observed in other models with replication stress, which is hydrocephaly. So they have this big, big skull. They are very small. And when you open the, the, these animals, this is the brain. This is the brain of a wild-type animal. This is where the, you know, here the forebrain should go here. And they're basically, they're missing the forebrain. And it's full with liquid. So this is, I mean, the message is that this is toxic even in heterozygosity when you eliminate in mammals. Okay, so of course, if it, still, even if it's important for embryonic development, there is the possibility that you can delete in adults, which is what you will want to mimic with a drug, right? I mean, in the adults, it's not that toxic. So to do that experiment, what we did is we used a CRE version that can be activated by tamoxifen so that you can have mice that are alive, and then you delete poly 3 so we did that by giving them tamoxifen in the diet. 
And then in our experience in the CNIO, from many, many, many different mice, this was the most toxic condition we've played with. So mice pretty immediately show very severe symptoms and die. And we verified that the gene is deleted, so this is from different organs. If you have a good eye again, you can see that in the spleen, there seemingly is no deletion of POLD3. This is not true. There is deletion, but because the spleen is a high turnover organ, the wild type cells that, did not, that escaped the deletion, they rapidly take over. And this is something you very frequently see with essential genes. Okay, so why is this? Of course, Part of the poly complex, we look at DNA replication, and this is in B cells where we delete with a, with a B cell specific allele. We see a major impact of this uh, of poly three deletion in DNA replication. This is a very crude approximation by FACS. We also did fiber assays, and we see, I mean, when we delete poly three in the B cells, basically we see a severe decrease in DNA replication. This was done together with Juan Mendez, and. Um, from this analysis, you can actually look specifically because POLD3 has been also linked to translation synthesis. So we wanted to address precisely in origin-driven DNA replication whether there was a problem, and you can also do that by focusing on symmetric force. So this is actually coming from an origin, and if we focus precisely there, there is also a problem. So POLD3 is important, you know, besides TLS, besides VIR, besides whatever you want, it's very important for canonical origin-driven DNA replication. So why? So to understand why, what we did is we did simply proteomics. So we IP'd POLD3 from wild-type B lymphocytes, from the null extracts. Then we compare the proteome, and we look for proteins that change in abundance in the two conditions. So if you do that completely unbiased, the list comes as this, so which is nice. It tells you that the IP is working, so you purify POLD1, POLD2, and POLD4. But you can also see that the abundance goes pretty severely down in the knockout. Suggesting that when you eliminate POLD3, the whole complex is destabilized. And to address that, we actually took MEF and we serum starved them, so we arrest them. Then we had a tamoxifen for three days, and POLD3 goes away, but so does POLD1, so does POLD2. By the way, POL epsilon doesn't change. So the POLD complex precisely in mammalians, if you eliminate POLD3, goes away. And the cells, if you now release them into serum, they have major problems in DNA replication. So basically, the message of this first part of the talk is that POLD3 is haploinsufficient for DNA replication. I didn't show you the data, but we actually looked to DNA replication in heterozygous, and it's also compromised in these mice, cells from these mice. The deletion in adult mice is severely toxic as well. Uh, the mechanism we think it's simply because the POLD3, like many other complexes, you limit one protein, the complex is destabilized in mammals. And I think if you want to go forward and study the functions of POLD3 and other things like BIR or TLS, this approach is not feasible. I mean, you probably you need to find a separation of function mutant that is able to do normal DNA replication and where you can study these things. Okay, so this is the work of Mati and Emilio mostly, together with Thanos and Juan that helped very, very heavily. And then the second part of the talk is a kind of, it's a side project. We've been doing screenings with different ways. You know, we've been doing CRISPR, but of course, like many others, we also explore the idea of doing genetic screenings using haploid cells. And I will, talk in, I will be talking about some, I think, the interesting findings for those of you that consider doing these things. So, okay, so what is the benefit? Of, I, I guess it's obvious what is the benefit of using haploid cells, particularly if you want to do genetic screenings or forward genetics. You only have to mutate one, one chromosome, right? So that's why, among other things, GIST has been the champion for genetic screenings. That's the main advantage. If you want to do genetic screenings in diploids, that's more complicated. You need to hit both. And one way to go forward was, has been RNAi and other things, but I don't have to tell you here that the, the, the problem is of using RNAi for screenings and of targets and all of these things. So as an alternative to this, in the last uh, six, seven years, different ways to, to work with haploid mammalian cells have emerged. So uh, the first one was found by serendipity, kind of. So it was a chronic myeloid leukemia already discovered in 1999 that happens to be haploid. And the reasons for this are still not clear, but it is haploid. And in an effort to try to make these cells into induced pluripotent stem cells, the effort failed, but they w came with this cell line, which nobody actually knows what it is. It's just a failed attempt to be pluripotent, but it grows as adherent, and it's just useful. I mean, you have a haploid adherent, so it's easier to work, and most people end up using HAP1 cells. So here the champion and most of the credits will go to Time Brummelkamp. He basically developed this tool to do screening, you know, genetic screens, and he has made very important things with them, like identifying the receptors used by the Ebola or Lassa viruses for infection, and many, many amazing things. In addition to this cancer cell line, 
the, the, which may contain additional mutations. There is another way to generate haploidy, and this is simply by mimicking fertilization. So what you do is you isolate the oocytes. This has been done uh, actually very recently in human oocytes as well. But normally, I mean, you take mice oocytes, you stimulate, you, 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 it, you cheat, so you mimic fertilization by adding strontium chloride, and then this, the embryo starts to develop as haploid, and then you can short, do fact short here, and you get cultures that really look like stem, normal stem cell cultures, only that they happen to be haploid. And then once you have them, you can, you can do mutagenesis, screenings, and all of these things. And this was first done by Anton Woods in 2011, but now has been reproduced by many labs, and we are able, we're also doing it at the CNIO in Madrid. Okay, so... There is one dark side that you only know about when you start to work with these things, that it's not on the papers. Nobody tells you until you start working with them, which is that if you get these cells, if you don't short for haploidy very fast, you end up with a diploid culture. And we know this because when we ordered the cells, nobody advised for this, and then within one month, we had the diploid culture. And then said, oh, but everybody knows that they diploidize. Well, I, I certainly didn't. <laughs> so if we, if we, if you get these cells, they become diploid cultures very fast. You know, within 10 passages, you end up with a diploid culture. And uh, they, they, when I talk with Anton Woods and others, they said, well, they, the genome is unstable. Just try it, diploid as very fast. But that, to me, you know, what's diploidization? So how does this happen? So we start to do, like, very basic one-on-one -on -one questions. So is this, is this really happening? How does it work? So the first thing we did is, do, do they really diploidize? So to, to address that, we, we did is very simple. We took these HAP1 cells and we sorted them out in haploids and diploids. And then, you know, ABC experiments. The first thing we noticed is that the haploids grew much worse than the diploids. So just isolate them, you put them to grow, and the haploids poorly grow. So of course, that immediately tells you that, well, maybe it's not diploidization. It's simply that you have a mixed culture and the other ones overgrow. So that's, that's the problem. It's not diploidization. It's simply an overgrowth. So to do that, we, we basically sorted haploids and diploids. We labeled them with the stably in red and green, and we put them together, let them go. And sure enough, if you do the experiment, you mix them at 50-50, and they won. You let them go, and you, you know, the, the diploids basically overtake, 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 until basically you end up with a diploid culture. So it was not really diploidization. It was basically an overgrowth. I, I mean, I don't think it's necessary to be dogmatic. There might be some level of diploidization. So you can start with one cell, then they start to divide. There might be a rare event where there is diploidization, and then this cell line takes over. But I think the problem in the lab, mostly you face, is this one, that the diploids will grow much better. So uh, if this was correct, then the other corollary to this is very simple. So, OK, so if this is the problem, then in principle, rather than sorting for populations, we can single cell sort. And then because there is no competition, then the haploids should stay haploid for longer, right? So that's exactly what we did. We sorted to single cells the haploids and the diploids, and then we let them go. And that's exactly what happens. So if we now single sort the haploids, they remain haploid for a pretty long time, like up to one month. In one month, normally, this doesn't happen. You end up with a diploid culture. So this is a simple procedure that you know, it can be implemented immediately. OK, so the next question is why. So why does a haploid grow poorly? What is the fundamentals here, and, and, and what is the mechanism? So here we, we got the idea from, from many studies, from Angelica Amon, David Pellman, and many others, that ploidy problems lead to activation of p53. So if you're tetraploid, this activates p53. The reasons for this, I don't think they're clear even today. But tetraploidy is sensed and activates p53. Aneuploidy is sensed and activates p53. So of course, the, what we did is we tested whether p53 was high in these cells. And it was. So if you simply sort out and you do western blotting, you can see that there is a p53 activation together with p21 in the haploids compared to the diploids. So it's high, but it's this relevant. So to do that, we make a knockout with, with CRISPR of, of P53 in the HAP1 cells. And what you see, if, if in the clones that we isolated that were wild type, there was no bias. In like 50-50 were haploids or diploids. But in the clones that we isolated from this experiment that were P53 knockout, many of them still remained P53. And then if we take these cells and let them go, you know, we could, you know, by 55 days, you basically have almost no haploids in the wild types. We still have something like 40% of haploidy in the, in, the, in the 53 knockouts. So p deletion does help to remain haploid in these cells. And this is just examples uh, of, you know, in the wild types, this is the, what you normally get in day one, and then you let them go, almost no haploidy. 
and in the 53 knockouts, you have a lot of haploid in day one, you still remain haploid. Okay, but out of fairness, it's true that this cell line, the HAP1, it has several translocations, it has several extra pieces of chromosomes, so potentially we could be looking to maybe like a pseudo aneuploidy checkpoint rather than a true uh, haploidy checkpoint. So to, to, to look precisely at the primary cell type, we went to the, to the mouse stem cells. And here what we did is we took P53 females, we isolated the oocytes, we did this strontium chloride trick, and we generated haploid P53 knockout and wild type stem cells from these oocytes. And you could pretty, we could pretty immediately see that in the, in the wild type clones that we were able to isolate, the levels of haploid were very low, so they were mostly diploids. And in the clones that we used from the P53 knockout, we have a number of them that looked already good from the start. And this is rare, also according to Anton. Normally, you have to really sort and sort and sort and sort until, until you get something going. So this already smells right. And then if you let them, you know, if you actually take these cells and you let them grow, we actually could keep the P53, this is how they look in early passages. So the wild type stem cells that you generate through this protocol, and this is normal, this is what happens in most labs. So you start this experiment, you end up with something like this, very few haploids that we, you have to sort and sort and sort and sort and you, until you get the ES culture that it's haploid. But in the P53 knockout, already from the start, it looked promising. In the, even the early passages look P53, you look quite haploid, and then they remained haploid for long. Okay, so the final question is why? So why is haploid sensed? What leads to P53 activation? Why is this checkpoint? Short message is that we don't, out of fairness, we don't know. And I think, I mean, I think it's fair to say that the knowledge of how an euploidy links to 53 activation, how tetraploidy, it's still somewhat rudimentary. I mean, there are some exercises, but it's still unclear how ploidy content leads to 53 activation. So, out of fairness, we do not know. But we know something. So, one thing we know, I mean, the first thing that we, of course, thought is, okay, P53 is up, P21 is up. That's easy, so the cells are not growing, and the other ones do grow, simple. So that was puzzling because as much as I pushed my student because I did not believe that result, every time she did it, that was not the case. So the cells were entering, even P53 is up, P21 is up, the cells were entering into a phase pretty okay. So that was strange. So it's not, it's not death, it's not, it's not a G1 arrest. So what is it? So to address that, we Finally, what we did is we took these stem cells, the haploid stem cells, and we labeled them with H2BEFP, and then we recorded videos simply just to see. So what happens to the cells? What, you know, what is the problem here? And then we, we analyzed this, uh, the behavior of the different cultures in these videos, and then we plotted in this way. So what these plots show is each line here, each blue line, is the life of a cell. So the, the you know, basically this is interface, and the, this, the dark blue is mitosis. And if the line ends prematurely, it means that cell, the cell is gone, the cell has died. So in wild type diploid stem cells, this is how it looks. You know, most cells are happy, they go through mitosis and they remain happy. In the diploids, but P53 knockout, they, if anything, they're a little bit happier, but they, you know, they look very similar to the wild types, no problem. So this is the problem. This is a haploid stem cell culture. So basically, cells go away from this. It's not that they did not grow. It's not that they stop proliferating, but basically are eliminated. So all of these guys, they, they basically are rest, they, 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 they died. And if you have a good eye, you can see that most frequently they die close to the last mitosis or near the last mitosis. So we think it has to do with segregation problems. What happens then with 53 knockouts is that you basically rescue this. So this is not that surprising. Cells die, you limit 53, they don't die anymore, you know? And, but it has a price. The price is that when we analyze these videos and we show, we score for abnormalities that we can identify with this H2BGFP system, in the haploids we see a lot of segregation problems, but cells do die, but in the 53 knockouts we see segregation problems. You can also see that the duration of mitosis is elongated, which basically tells you that the, you know, the cells are, have problems to going through mitosis, and they end up with a lot of, you know, making abnormalities. So limited P53 stabilizes haploidy, but with a price, which is that you are basically accumulating problems that came through segregation. Okay, so the summary of the second part is that the, the, this thing about diploidization, we don't think it's correct. It's probably, I mean, the problem that we face in the lab when we try to do these genetic screenings is the overgrowth of the diploids, that they grow better than the, than the haploids. 
uh, we, we cannot be, I don't think we need to be categorical. There might be some diploidization. And if, in fact, if we isolate a single cell with time, there will be one event where they diploid us, and then they grow much better. But I don't, I don't think that's the problem that we mostly face. Then a P53 dependent cytotoxic checkpoint or response limits the expansion of these mammalian haploid cells. Single serial sorting helps if you to, in, to basically keep them as haploids. So we propose that that this is actually, I don't know why, but somehow I think that this is probably the same thing that is operating in the tetraploidy checkpoint, it's probably operating here. And maybe this is just, you know, it just smells very different. It, it smells similar in how the checkpoint operates. So we, pro we propose the existence of some sort of ploidy checkpoint, which basically unifies both, like which the problems in the number of ploidy activate a P53 response that limits the expansion of these cells. And this is the final slide, so what now? I mean, we have this, of course. The first thing is still, we have the question, like, like I think Angelica and David, they have the aneuploidy, so why does aneuploidy active 53? Why does, you know, the, what is this activated? Then there's a challenge, can we make, this has not been made, can you make a differentiated cell line, like, you know, nih 3 kind of, that it's haploid, this is, apparently it's not doable. When you try to differentiate, they, be, they become diploid for whatever the reason. And we're trying to make a haploid mouse, and this might look crazy, but you can make a tetraploid mouse. There's ways to do it, and we think it can succeed in some organs at least. So we're doing this, and this is the work of Teresa mostly in the lab, Teresa Albridge. Okay, so this is the credits. So the, the work of Paul III was mostly done within my lab, was driven mostly by Matilde and Emilio. And this was a nice collaboration with the lab of Thanos and also Juan Mendez and Javier Muñoz at the CNIO. And the work on the haploid is mostly the work of Teresa together with Sergio and Cristina. And we, we got help from, the, from this um, transgenic unit at the CNIO that did all of the oocyte and, and all of these experiments. So this is the lab that, at the CNIO that you, you will see. And, and as, I guess as you know, but only to, to, to show you, to present, I do have another lab in, for those that did ask during the meeting at Karolinska in a more you know, in, a, in a, a little bit colder environment, and these the people. But this lab is mostly focused on, on doing, almost exclusively focused on doing in uh, cell-based uh, uh, drug screens, like we did for the 18 inhibitor, but for other questions. So, with this, I will be happy to take questions. 